The Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo. Have you heard that Airtel Tigo calls from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and Airtel Tigo money transfers are now free on new sims? Now you know. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple. Welcome to The Point of View. This is your favorite current affairs show on television. Here on The Point of View, we get the right guests. We ask them relevant questions on issues that matter to you. It's an interactive show. If you like what you hear or you dislike what you hear, send us your thoughts on the WhatsApp number on the screen. We also have a very vibrant conversation on the social media platforms you are watching from. I have a very special guest tonight. When we come back, I'll tell you who she is. See, morning. I just sent you a tell to go money from my new number. We delivered two healthy kids last night. Congrats. Have you heard? Kwesi has two kids. Have you heard? My son has two kids. I was he? No, 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 no. No, yes, this time I'm going to stop Have you heard the news about the missing ticket? Have you heard? Get free calls and free Airtel Tigo money transfers for six months on new Airtel Tigo Sims. Get a Sim today. So welcome back. So a lot of you have been asking me, when are you interviewing the candidates and their running mate? Well, we're lucky to have the first in hopefully a series of big interviews. My guest is the, I don't know what to call her, newly named because she's been in this for at least four months now. Certainly a fresh face in terms of the ticket. Professor Jenna Nopokwa Jiman is the NDC party's running mate. She's an accomplished educationist and a professor. And she's speaking to us for the next few minutes on the campaign, the election, and what it means. Prof, great to have you. Nice to have you too. You, you, were, you were nominated in July. We are in October, so that's four months, four or five months. It's been How interesting, has it been? it's been challenging, um, it's been educating, and I'm very happy to be doing this. Is it grueling? Though? Is it grueling though? Because I, I, was, I, was, I know you've been, been to at least eight regions. Life for, I keep saying that life for any woman is grueling. Can't be. But I think uh, what makes it less grueling, what makes it interesting, is how you plan your day. Mm. I used to tell young ladies at the campus that your day will not get longer because you are busy. It will still be 24 hours. So it's a question of how mm. you partition those 24 hours. And more than that, how you feel about what you are doing. If you enjoy what you are doing, if you feel it is useful for others, then uh, you can put your grueling part on the back burner. But it doesn't mean you should just keep go, go, go. Mm. You must also have time to really take it easy. So what, what are you? Are you a technocrat? Are you a politician? Because first time I heard you, I, I've heard you on radio. I was in, I think, secondary school as a host. Then VC of UCC. I was at Legon. Then Minister of Education. Then, now this, of course, presidential debate as well. So, so, Prof, at what point did you become a politician? Because I know you've done a bit of radio hosting, of course, run UCC, Minister of Education, presidential debate. At, at what point did Professor Nana Jinopuka Jiman become... <laughs> or were you a politician throughout? Have you been a politician throughout? That, that's an interesting question. Um, if we break it down, as what it is, as what politics is. And if we define it loosely as uh, having access to power, mm -hmm. having access to resource, um, especially in terms of power, you need to ask yourself, where did the power come from? Mm. And for what reason do you have that power? That power has been given to you by somebody. Mm. And that power should be returned to that person to empower the powerless, if I may put it that way. So insofar as you are running a school, you are heading 
a department or a faculty, you are heading a university or a ministry, you are in that unique position to support others. Mm -hmm. And if that is what politics is, then I believe you're a politician too. So let me rephrase that. At <laughs> what point do you become partisan? Because the reason is that when we did your profile, some of the content was when you were on Radio Gold, you interviewed former President Rawlings, and Radio Gold is perceived to be NDC leaning. But after that, you ran a whole university before you became a Minister for Education. So at what point did, have you always been NDC? Let me explain something to you. When I was invited to host the program, it was called Platform. And I was coming from Cape Coast. I remember having discussion with the management that, why me? Can't you find someone from Accra? And I was told, no, they wanted somebody who would be fair, who would be seen to be fair to everybody. And I like that. I, yes, I interviewed um, His Excellency J.J. Rollins. I also interviewed Kufo. I interviewed all the presidential aspirants at the time. And um, in so far as, you know, Party A is saying, no, you are not fair to a candidate. You ask tough questions and everybody is saying the same. Then you know you are being fair. So it is that fairness that I've tried to exhibit in all my life. You are the university teaching students. Does not matter whether they vote or they don't vote or they go to church or they don't? That's not your concern. Your concern is who are these people becoming? What am I teaching? Is it going down well? Are they participating? Are they, you know, are they with me? Am I with them? You know, so these are some of the issues you ask yourself. And it is that attitude that I've taken everywhere with me. If I'm at the ministry, you saw the things we did there. We never said, oh, this is our stronghold, so let's go and put the school there. That's not our stronghold, so let the kids suffer. We never did that. We did a very, very objective study of the situation in the country, and we accordingly tackled. So in the end, somebody may ask, oh, why did you put a big market in Kumasi when it is not your, your uh, stronghold? And I believe that this, will be an ex this should be an example to all of us that it is one country, everybody has given you their power, some didn't vote for you, that's not the issue. But you are there to serve the entire country and you should be seen to be very fair to all of them. It is the NDC that has reached out to me. I've accepted because I share in their philosophy of social democracy. I share in the emphasis on the vulnerable, on the poor. So when we were in the ministry, removing schools from under trees, ensuring that the public schools that most people will vote with their money away from, were also doing well. These are the things that resound, or rather resonate very well with what I think society should be doing. We should start from the margins and then move towards the middle. So that is my conviction too. We'll, we'll talk about NDC's policies on education, but now we are here, let me just wrap up on the issues of moderation, because you moderated IEA yes. uh, presidential debate 2012. Yes. The, your opposite number at the time is now information minister. Some people perceive that the two of you were selected because of your political leanings. Is that correct? Listen, when I, I heard of this, I wasn't even in the country. My term as vice chancellor had come to an end. I'd handed over October 1st, which is a significant day for me because it's my son's birthday. And that same day, I had to leave for Paris because I was on the executive board of UNESCO. And normally UNESCO, it's a three-week meeting. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. And so I thought that, oh, this is the first time I'm going to give UNESCO my fullest attention because I'm not going to worry, call, register, you know, what's going on and so on. So I was at UNESCO when I got that call. And I remember name withheld. And I remember telling the person, listen, this is such an involving thing that you need a lot of time to prepare. So can't you find someone else? Again, like platform. And he said, listen, when you come home, then you'll understand why we want you to do this. So yes, the meeting ended. I came home. I even tried to influence the timetable they had set. And they said, if you know the trouble we had gone through, getting everybody to agree on this. So the long and the short is that I, I was not invited to that debate by the NDC. Far from it. I was invited to that debate because somebody thought I'd be fair. And I like that fairness. Yes, uh, I'm supposed to be tough and all of that, but fairness, justice for me is very important. Giving everybody a fair opportunity. It wasn't Mahama who called So it's just a coincidence. Or, uh, so it, it's just a coincidence that both of you are now leading 
members of the two main parties at the time? Well, at the time, I'm not sure if I could have called myself a leading member of the NDC. You know, I just finished my term as vice chancellor. And I, I also, I've also heard some of those comments like, oh, yeah, that is why you were made minister for education. And I said, oh, these people don't know me. Do they think that's all I could have bargained for if that was the case? But, you know, um, it's a recognition that you'll do a good job. You know, that in itself puts a lot of responsibility on you because people want to be president. Why not? Why do you want to be president? That is all. Even the, questions, the, the question bank was not created by us. People oh, really? Know, oh, yeah, there's so much in it. A lot I will not Because do. in the U.S., I was watching the uh, Chris Wallace debate, uh, Joe Biden, Trump, and he said, he wrote the questions. So he, he essentially said, these are my questions. Well, in our case, it wasn't the, you know, that wasn't it. I see. So we didn't the, the organizing but, but the body. Yes, the follow-up, of course, you never know, like what we are doing, um, you can never predict follow-up questions. You can predict some, but not all of them. Okay. But because I'm sure, it I'm, depends on how the uh, interviewee responds to a question. You had the latitude to do follow-ups. You have to do follow-ups. Because, you see, the person is there to explain why they want the position. Not to you, but to the audience. And so you want to give the space for the person to articulate what it is that they want to say as clearly as possible. Okay, this is an unplanned follow-up. <laughs> Professor, there's an unplanned follow-up. Professor Batils... You'll get an unplanned <laughs> answer. Now no, go no, on. Professor, <laughs> am I right nicely about you? Narrate your work in many pages, and then you also give the foreword for that book. Have you been surprised at the re reaction to the book you wrote? Of course, I've been um, surprised because the niche, this is not the first forward I've ever written in my life. But this is a forward that has received such reaction. A forward is not a critique. I'm in literature, for God's sake. A forward is not a critique. It is not an introduction. It's not an analysis. When you're doing those kinds of assignments, there are different ways you go about them. The first simply introduces the, 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 the essence of the book. And that's exactly what it was. So I was very, very surprised, yes. I was really, really surprised. And I said, oh, is that how polarized we become? No, that, that's actually interesting because your message when you were nominated and subsequently you've tried to say we should do a new kind of politics. How surprised have you been about the, the nature of political commentary in Ghana? Yes, I think that is what calls for the new politics. Listen, we are a small country. When we compare ourselves with America, it's over 50 states. We are like one state, one small state in America. We have very, very serious basic issues. You just talked about having told, about our having told the eight regions. There are many things we have seen, and I feel there are many hurdles that we should have jumped by now. Here we are in Accra. COVID came, we had some rebates, water, electricity. I will not say it's a bad thing, but you see there are people without that water, without that electricity. And I think that we should be interested in them too. There are streets that are so dusty, you can't imagine, even during the day, you can't see your way forward. The, and water, roads, I mean, Nobody should be begging for that. There are places where, you know, when you're driving by, you see women with pails on their heads going to fetch water. And I keep looking, following to see, will they branch off the road? Is there water by the road they're going to fetch? Sometimes it's by the road. And I noticed this a long time ago when I was doing research in Upper West. Okay. So you see all of these things happening. And I don't think we should be sitting here fighting each other over things that sometimes I don't even understand. We are in a country still hinged on primary commodities, still importing things that we can even do, and, and surprised that our youth don't have jobs. These are things that I feel, all po we, these are conversations that I thought politicians should be having. 
instead of this one said that and the other one didn't say this and denials and rejoinders and so on it's as if we don't have fundamental issues in this country but we do you live in a country where children can be in school from kg now has been added two years primary school six years eight already then you are three years of ghs that's a basic school and they still can't read and they can see and it, it's not even a subject for conversation it doesn't even bother us or we don't think that's as important as what politician a did or didn't do but some people say you need to compare records because all the things you're talking about political leadership is the driving force for change and if somebody offers themselves for leadership we have to know their track record so yes it may be presented as a, an argument about petty issues but it actually goes to the heart of our developmental challenge yes but then what records so we need to stay by the records let us stay by the records compare the records encourage people to do better that way we will move our country forward don't we we may not solve all the problems in one term, but we ought to be seen to be, to be even if in chain, it's still movement. Even if it's one step at a time, we're still getting somewhere. Some people think the NDC has had more opportunities than other parties. Even in our fourth Republican democracy, 92 to 2000, 2008 to 2016. That's 16 whole years. So if the situation is that dire, the party that you are leading should take some of that criticism. Everybody will take some of that. Let us not think. But even then, NDC had more. Because if you look at the democracy since 92, I haven't brought Rawlings 81. I'm just talking 92 to 2008. 2000, that's eight years. Kufour comes eight years. Mills, Mahama, another eight years. So even in our democracy, Fourth Republic, you've got 16. Eight plus three and a half. So that's. No, you are the one pointing out the problems. And I'm saying to you that your party has had more opportunities than others. So what is the record? In education, that's where the issue is. What's your, because you just told me that there are dusty roads, our kids can't read. Colleges of education. These are things are uh, achievements in the profession of science. This is not to say that. But how, how does turning a polytechnic into a technical university become an achievement?
Some people actually think that decision is counterproductive because we are missing out on the middle, that technician middle. Have we bothered to see how far do they train their people there? So, Prof, I want to understand, how does the technical university solve that? It solves that by raising the level of learning, by raising the level of performance. A diploma is not the same as a degree. A lot of the students, you look, you do the research, you'll find that, that a lot of the students will struggle so hard to get into the other tertiary institutions so they get degrees. And the saddest thing for me is that sometimes they want the degree so badly, they even veer off what they've done in the technical school. I've seen them in my own lecture theatre at UCC because they want degrees. So all the investment we have made in them in technical education is swept to the side because they want the degrees. So what does it take? Where are they now? What does it take to raise that level? So they'll be more productive. Technical education is not a very simple one thing. It's many, many, many things. If, for example, the person is, um, I mean, you look at the contracts we give in this country and look at the personnel that we import and look at their backgrounds. You do that with only one company. Then you'll see how we are shooting ourselves in the foot by remaining at the level that we have been forever. This is the point of view. We're talking to the running mate to the NDC for the 2020 elections, Professor Nana Jenopokwajiman. We're talking different policies. We'll delve into education when we come back in a greater detail. Stay with us. Anti-perspirant with the power of black carbon formula. 48-hour protection from sweat and bacteria. For a deep, clean feeling that lasts. New Nivea Men Deep Anti-Perspirant. Nivea Men. It starts with you. Official sponsor of Real Madrid. Welcome back to The Point of View. Our guest today is the running mate to the NDC flag bearer, John Dramani Mahama, Professor Nana Jinopoku Ajeman. She's been to eight regions already. She's going to go for another eight, and she's talking to us ahead of that next round of tours. We're trying to understand her thinking around some key policies. We'll spend a lot of time on education. Prof, I was going through the MPP manifesto, and I was, I don't know what I was surprised, but of all the areas, the listed achievements, education had 32. It seems as if this election, education is at the center. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, to have education as the lead message in an election. I think it should be the whole country. It should be the entire human development that should be at the lead. Because um, it's about the people in the end. It's about the people. When you single out um, any sector, I think the danger with that is to do what is popular or to do what people want to hear, not necessarily sometimes what is right. What is right may not always be very popular, but it may be necessary. So I would say that whatever the sector is, that we do the needful, we do the things that are important. So this even takes me back to our discussion on technical uh, universities. 
A lot of people said, no, we're going to turn all the technical, no, the polytechnics into ordinary universities. Who will do that? So if they had read our documents, if they had read our benchmarks, if they had read our policy, and if they had read our blueprint, they'd have seen the processes that were going to lead to that. So we started first with human audits. We did equipment audits. We did library audits. We did all kinds of audits to be able to, and we set our own benchmarks. We set them very high. If it was something pol uh, political, or you could have lowered the benchmarks and just pushed everybody in, just to say that, oh, I've been able to turn everybody, um, every polytechnic into a technical university. But that we didn't think was the right thing to do. So each of them had to meet that the, the standards we had set before they were converted. You know, so this is how I'll answer yeah. this. Um, so, so, but what the question again is, as with education being the lead issue, as an educationist, is that problematic? Because you are having the government say, we've done free SHS, 1.19 million new people are in school. That seems to be the message. For an education policy person who's become a politician now, is that okay? Should they bring it on? Are you going to also say, well, this is what we did in education, or education should not be used in campaigning? You can use anything in campaigning, but it's about the objective. Are you interested in the children learning? Are you going to tell us children are performing better? Education is about the outcome. Are you going to tell us, for example, that children in primary schools are now reading, are more literate, are more numerate? Is that interesting? Are you going to put that in your campaign? Are you going to put the numbers? Where will the numbers come from? The numbers don't increase. Right now, as I sit with you, we should know the number of children in JHS 2 will go to 3. All of them put together, you have a figure. OK? So if you decide they're all going, whether they pass or not, it doesn't matter. You need to ask yourself, why is this happening? Why do we even have the exam in the first place? What do exams do? What do you want these kids to become? What structure? Uh, you know, it's a very, very important conversation that we must have because it's about your humor. It's about the people in the country. Okay. But they have to go to school before they can read. Is, is that not uh, the, the so? Like the, the point yes, is, if we don't put them in school, they don't even start. I'm not chance. saying you shouldn't put them in school, but education doesn't begin at the secondary level. It begins at the primary level. Do we have any information there? Do those children matter? Well, look, I can read for you. They, they said they've increased the capitation grant. Mind you, uh, President Kufour introduced that grant, and within the few years of his governance, there was an increase in enrollment, which you are very familiar with. So you get people to stay in school. Then he introduced the school feeding program, because a lot of poor parents didn't have the impetus to send their kids to school. So there's capitation grant, there's school feeding program, that increased enrollment. So that seems to be, and it's, it's funny, that's the MPP policy. And you are the Social Democratic Party. You see, it doesn't matter. So when you came, did you cancel it? Or did you continue it? It doesn't matter if somebody has introduced something that is working. Has, has NDC government canceled these things? So what is the argument now? And you make all these interventions for a reason. What is the overall objective? It's overall objective that you are finally going to get a more, um, let me, I don't want to say the word useful, but a more capable workforce or not. Are you measuring that? When was the school feeding um, introduced? What was the objective of it? Or the capitation grant? Or how about, how about well-trained teachers? Does that matter? How about teaching and learning materials that are adequate? Is that important? How about the environment in which children learn? Now we, are, we have the, a rainy season upon us. All those schools under trees, what is happening to them? Is that also important? You see? So it's about the end result. You are doing this for what reason? What is the projection? What is the, what, what is the aim, rather? And what are the objectives under the aim? So what, what is the NDC? Because you're, you also mentioned building uh, infrastructure. Some, it's, it's the same as, an, it's also an output, it's not an outcome. Let me tell you, we built infrastructure and that is most of the things that the press, some of the press chose to talk about. 
You even mentioned it here in this interview. And, uh, and it's important. But you see, we also train teachers. We also raise the capacity of teachers. Why do you think we introduced all those laptops to teachers? It wasn't for the fun of it. There was a lot of independent studies going on. Kids rewriting exams and so on and so forth. Distance education catching up and so on and so forth. The face of teaching and learning was changing. And those interventions were very important. How does a teacher use a computer to teach physics? How does a child use the, sci the computer lab in the school to learn chemistry? You see, these are the intangible things. It's all about numbers, but they are aspects of quality. We did those things too. When we saw that children were not doing too well with science and math, and actually it was stopping some from moving up, what did we do? We isolated these subjects. We worked with Sandlos, and we're using other media to ensure that we can raise the capacity of teachers in teaching these subjects. If, for example, there's a school without a physics teacher, you can make it four years, you can make it 10 years. If you don't put a physics teacher in that school, no child will pass physics. Do you get me? Those we thought were very, very important interventions. If you are doing an apprenticeship program and you, are, you haven't looked at the profile of the master craftsman, you see, you haven't looked at their profile. So the kids are sent to apprentices. What happens there? Who is watching? Where is the, where is the report? These are all very, very important interventions in education. If you have not done the qualifications framework, to standardize ways even of offering apprenticeship programs and be able to, pro to provide proper certification. You can count all the numbers you want, but what are the children becoming? What are the learners becoming? But these didn't sound as popular, you know. That is why we're talking about if you politicize certain things, you may be leaning towards an area that may be good, other areas may not be so good. So you need a very, very healthy balance. So it's not enough to say, I've put a hundred and th you know, millions of children in school. Where are they taking a shift? What does it mean? Who has even evaluated this? Th that's fair enough, Prof. Some, some would argue that your party's view on free assistance has not been very clear. It has been very, very clear. But let me explain. We started the Progressively Free. Why did we start it? Again, you do research. Do any, you, you go to any school and pick the, look at the numbers, KG class uh, one and two. Then look at class one, two. By class three, you see something is happening. You also look at the gender breakdown and other breakdowns, uh, urban, rural, and so on. By the time you keep moving up, the numbers keep going down. That is where your intervention should be. If they don't complete the basic school, they won't be in the secondary school to enjoy whatever you are putting there. Okay, so you need to fix all these gaps. And why are we doing progressively free? We are doing progressively free because to operate it full scale at once, we thought to be highly problematic. Because if you look at the number of children who qualify and the number of children who are always admitted, you get this huge percentage of kids who are not going. You want them to come and learn what? They need the classrooms, they need the labs. So you see, we expanded 125 schools. We have the list, we have the items we put there, whether they were science labs or dormitories or kitchen or dining or whatever, or washrooms, 125. We also picked another 175 for what we call the quality improvement. The physical improvements are easy. They don't have a dormitory, so go and put one there. The quality improvements are not so easy. You need to do further work. So what happens is that you look at the performance of the school. How come in school X, nobody ever passes maths? You know it's not possible. You can't tell me there's not a single child there who could have passed. So let me understand. The, the progressive was yeah, that I'm, by I'm what time would they have? Because they Wait. came and did it immediately. Yeah, and what happened? 
They didn't do it immediately. They did it from Form 1 only. So they also followed the progressing. But they put 1.19 million people the in school number, now. And now, yes. because they've done it for three years. Yes. And what I'm saying is that they didn't do it at once. It was a three-year stretch, and we all know that. So we don't need How to different argue. was your approach? We have a high birth rate in this society, in this country. So this, this unique classroom block and so on wasn't going to... How much space do we have? We are told the sky is the limit. If it is true, you must raise the structures. And even at the lower levels, we did that with the millennial schools. And we're able to abolish the shift system at the lower levels. So coming to our, our concept at the time, it was to reach the vulnerable. It was to bring the school as close to the doorsteps of the learners as possible and to make sure that those schools were of high quality. That is why we put in the labs we did put in. That is why we put in the, uh, not only the science labs, but also the computer lab. That is why we stock the libraries properly. That is why we set up proper offices for the headmaster, assistant teachers. I've gone around and seen teachers, you know, propping a table against a tree and marking their papers, really. How, what kind of quality work are they going to do? If the head of maths wants to have a chat with his colleagues, where is he going to have them? So we put offices there. They were all very important. So, so you, you were putting plans in place before rolling it out in full? You see, we started. Eh? I, we didn't think that we should just go ahead and do a mass. Fair enough. I'm asking this because your manifesto now is promising a couple of things. And the secondary, you say you want to expand free SHS to cover uh, students in private senior high schools in underserved areas. Yes. And in technical education, you say you will provide free TVET at the secondary and tertiary levels. And then you say you will abolish the double track system. Is, is this not the same thing? You're, you're, well, how different is this from what? Uh, but the double, double track is there. So how can it be the same? We say we'll abolish double track. We'll say we'll abolish something that exists. No, but I'm talking about the, so the TVET that you want to expand. Is, is that progressive or immediate? Because the manifesto just says we will provide free technical and vocational education at the secondary and tertiary level. Sounds very similar to free SHS of 2012. No, no, no. We are talking about TV. tertiary. Yes, but I'm saying you, you didn't and say And we it's are talking about, about focus on technical vocational education. But you say you make it free. Yes. You didn't qualify it. As you, you, what? You, because you just explained that your, 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 free, your policy of free... At that time, okay? This is a new manifesto, isn't it? Yeah. So you're not going to judge the new manifesto by the old standards. The old standards were to ensure that as many children as possible went to those schools by expanding the facility so they could come to school and learn like everybody else. Definitely, I'd like to believe that um, most of us expected that the free SHS was simply going to operate as business as usual. Three terms, everybody in class at the same time, going on vacation and coming back. You know, not, not, or at least I didn't anticipate some of the issues that we are facing. We have seen that those issues are not helpful. So you need to confront them, okay? And if you say we are going to do the uh, Tibet, you remember, and again, you know, maybe the press wasn't too interested in that. We picked 13, uh, technical schools, visited each one of them, did a human audit in each one of them, came with a report on equipment audit and understood where some of the problems were. And where to were some of the problems? One was that some of the teachers even had a refresher course. Who trained those people? What support do they need? How about equipment? You know, how about even the environment? And even when, you, when we did the study of the secondary technical, you will see how in a place like Secondary Takrade Technical School, that was such a strong technical school, the population in technical education has all dwindled. And in most of the schools that were secondary technical, you could tell from their reports, from their submissions, from their requests, that there was hardly any attention on the technical, uh, at the technical level. So that is why we cleared the path from the technical school right up to the technical university. Okay, so if we say we are going to make that free, it is in order because you see you want to add value to your uh, to your primary commodity. Who is going to do that? Fair for enough. You? What is the NDC's view on the teacher licensure exams? 
the literature license, you see, there was this Act 778, passed in 2008, where Nanda was nowhere near the ministry, and President Mahama was nowhere near the presidency. It was passed in 2008. There were three things that needed to happen. The NACA, the National Teaching Council, the NACA is a curriculum people, the National Teaching Council, and the National Inspectorate Board. So when I came to the ministry, I was wondering, why were these done? Especially the National Inspectorate Board, when we have a whole inspectorate division of the Ministry of Education. So after observing things for a while, I said, well, I'm not surprised. I'm sure somebody simply got fed up with this whole thing and thought we needed one. It's been passed into law, it is there. But coming to the licensure exam, it was also in that law that there will be a teacher's licensure exam. I had conversations with those who were part of it to find out wh wh what, is that, what is it that we need to do. Because in this country, we certify our teachers before they come out. And at the University of Cape Coast, for the long, you know, we, s we supervise the, um, the um, training colleges from everything. They take our certificates. Okay. And the vice chancellor sits at the professional board. So I had a little bit of experience with this whole thing. So I was wondering, after they've gone through all these processes, what is this exam exactly going to do? From what the report I got, it's like we needed to find a way of standardizing all of them. Because when everybody is doing something, Kekos is doing something, and so on. And I said, ah, but we have the NCTE. The NCTE has an academic board. I've said on that before. And we standardize the programs at that level. So what is, what is left? You know, in some countries, they may not necessarily train their teachers the way we do. In some countries, from state to state, what they do. And so at some point, you need to, um, to administer this exam. So what I thought then that we could do was to use this as a measure of quality assurance. Because one of the things that surprised me at the ministry was that, ah, that at the tertiary level, we have a whole national accreditation board. But at the lower level, that I thought is even more critical. We don't have those kinds of quality assurance mechanisms. In fact, the greatest will be the examining body, WAIEC. But I thought that the process itself should start before then. So I thought we could, we could use this as a, as a quality assurance mechanism, in which case it will not require going to sit down three hours doing some multiple questions and when, when you pass that all. I thought we should introduce other ways of helping the teachers to grow because of the nature of the profession. Mm. Uh -huh. So that is why we don't think that the sit down is the best way. exam and especially when the rule is that when you fail you can't teach at all. We'll take a break on that point. When we come back she has a few more regions to go through, 55 days to the election. What are the key messages to Ghanaians? My guest is Professor Nana Jinopoku Ajeman, running mate to John Dramani Mahama, NDC flag bearer. Stay with us. Comprehensive news. The City Newsroom at 8 p.m. on City TV is your most engaging news bulletin on TV. It's it's a very act. Oh, that's that's too bad. It, the youth are still throwing stones. They are still throwing stones here into our direction. And can I come in? I want to come in. Okay. Telling your stories better with correspondence covering every corner of the country. Getting access to potable water is a daily struggle for residents of Kakichakopi and Balekopi communities in the Abda East District of the Greater Accra Region. City Newsroom at 8pm, very fluent with issues that concern you. 
with City Newsroom, your community is now connected. In this our community, all of us, we are very sorry about this school. If we go to see the children, they are so small, so small. Even my grandchildren are there. My grass outside there. If they come out of the school, I have a visit. Every day at 8 p.m., City Newsroom is live on City TV. This is the point of view. Tonight, our guest is the running mate to the NDC flag bearer, Professor Nana Jinopokwajiman. She's done eight regions, 55 days to election. She admits it's been grueling, but she's getting ready to go again. <laughs> 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 so, in this central, which is your, your, your home region, western, western, north, up, upper east, north, east, northing, and then Bono. So, what's the, what's the itinerary? You, where, where are you going next? What, what's the message? Uh, next, I'm going to the Ashanti region. Wow. Uh, from Ashanti, we'll come back to Accra for maybe two days. Then we'll go to Volta, Oti, Savannah, Upper West, and then... Wow. Rap I mean, I know you've traveled around the country, but it must be different doing so as a running mate. I mean, what are you seeing that you didn't used to see? No, actually, the things I'm seeing are not too different okay. from what I saw when I was Minister for Education. Mm. Because you know that I did a lot of field work. We were hardly in the ministry. Because we wanted to see exactly what was going on with the schools. And in Ghana, we have many schools everywhere. So um, going around the country in that respect is not too um, surprising. There's a different pace and for a different reason and so on. Um, it is to see where we are at as a country and where we can be. What has helped us is the way we did our manifesto. Mm. It's about the broad consultations we held. We went to the field, talked to people, went to regions, sought. You know, when we were hit by COVID, then we had to stop the physical movement and seek memos, phone calls, text messages, and so on. So we had a sense of what it was that was bothering the people, which is confirmed. A lot of it is confirmed by what we have seen. And I, earlier on, I mentioned basic amenities. People are not even asking for the moon. And people saying they are tired of politicians. On my show last week, radio, a lot of people were saying they are tired of NDC and MPP. Do you get that, think that so. same thing? No, I'm not getting that. Maybe if they are tired of a certain party, they should say so. You see, that generalization is They said they thing. are tired of both of you. No, no, they are not. No, it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I believe them. But all I'm saying is that let us compare records and let's go forward because we can't get... But are you getting... We have decided this is how we want to run our country. Okay. Until that changes, that's what we have. Well, my question is, what message... So you, what message you, when you go to say, vote on next two, three weeks, what are you going to tell them? Me, it's a message of hope. It's a message of hope in the sense of what they are asking for that is possible to work together to achieve. So building consensus is very important. We know jobs, jobs, jobs... It's on the heart of everybody. We can't find jobs, we've lost our jobs, and so on and so forth. Cocoa farmers are saying our yields are not as good as they used to be. Uh, yam farmers are saying we have all the stockpile of yam, the roads are bad, we can't transport them, and so on and so forth. So the needs may not be uniform. Each area may have its own um, his own, uh, let's say, needs. But you see, you need to connect all these dots and give a message of hope that yes, it is possible for us working together to achieve a different But how different will this NDC be from the one that lost in 2016? Now, you see, the question for me also is, 
Why is it that soon after we lost, too soon after we lost, people were running back? Which people? Oh, all the same people who voted against us. You know, it was too early. I thought it would be about two or three years before the living remember we existed. Really? Oh, yes. So you go, and again, you get that feel when we got that feel when we were doing our manifesto. A cocoa farmer will tell you, oh, we used to have uh, our uh, fertilizer for free. And we're told they'll increase the, uh, the price. You were stealing our money and giving it to us. So it was not true. We should vote for them. They'll give us something different. And lo and behold, now but they are selling. The price. Yeah, I know. But I'm, I'm reporting something to you. And, and lo and behold, now they're selling Living it to us. Living income differential. They've increased yes. it. Yes, but a bag is 80. If he needs 50 bucks for his farm, how much has he paid? A bag of what? Of fertilizer. We are told the fertilizer was being smuggled. So even though it was free, it wasn't getting to them. So we, they, we should sell it. But you a, give them, we should, we should you increase the, the amount so, you them per bag. So they get more money. Being, uh, f uh, what do you call it? Smuggled. It cannot be a good thing. You find a way to stop the smuggling. You also look at the effect it is having on the cocoa production. All of a sudden you're getting huge um, tons. Is that also bad? Are you throwing away the, the baby with the bathwater? Go and stop the, the smuggling. Just recently we had police in a certain region because we said they are coming to vote. What were those army people doing about stopping the, the, the smuggling? So please, you know, we need to get serious. So that is what they were telling us. That now I needed 50 bucks. 50 times 50, what is that? How much has this been increased? So in any case, that's the story they told us. And I'm just narrating it to you. Okay, so now this is it. We can't do this, our shoots are dying. A whole lot of complaints. And they themselves can make the comparison. And that is why they are running to So how optimistic are you that you will win? <laughs> People have asked me this question. You don't go into a race to lose. You go into a race to win. That's how I'll answer your question. So come December 7, Ghanaians will vote for the NDC to win and become the next government. Why not? They have every reason to do so. I wish you well. I need to thank all those who have bothered to listen. Okay. Um, I want to thank them for their time, their interest. And I want to thank the many, many people who through phone calls, WhatsApp, so many messages just encouraging us to soldier on. We are extremely grateful. You said you've done all these regions. The reception has been overwhelming. I want to thank all of them. And not only, you know, the people in t-shirts, yes, but what has really touched me, the old people coming on their walking stick, just coming to say thank you, God bless you, and so on, it's been truly, truly overwhelming. And I want to really, through your medium, say thanks to everyone. We, we're speaking to the running mate to the National Democratic Congress, Professor Nana Jinopokwa Jiman, uh, took a, a bit of a break to speak to us because we understand she's going back on the field. And we've been trying to get her mind on some key issues. A lot of this was on education. Hopefully we'll get her again to speak on other issues. Thank you for watching. We'll see you another time. Bye-bye. The Point of View is powered by Airtel Tigo. Have you heard that Airtel Tigo calls from 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. and Airtel Tigo money transfers are now free on new sims? Now you know. Airtel Tigo. Life is simple.